So my name is Trevor Bakken. I'm a scientist in the human cell types group and currently exploring transcriptional diversity of cells derived from human neurosurgical tissue and postmortem samples. But today I'll tell you about a couple of projects that I did um, looking at non-human primate development. So we have this very rich, high resolution uh, data set looking at rhesus monkey brain development uh, with very fine uh, laminar resolution samples and microarray profiling across both prenatal and postnatal ages. And so we can really look at how how neurons mature, how their transcriptional programs change over, over the whole brain development. And then I'll shift gears and tell you about a project I did in collaboration with Sante Pabo, um, where they really identified these human-specific changes um, in protein-coding genes um, <clears throat> compared to our closest relatives based on this very nice work they did you know, with the sequencing of these ancient genomes and looking to, for putative functional um, putative function of these changes uh, based on the nice developmental atlas we have of the human brain. So uh, the cytoarchitecture of cortex is highly conserved across mammals. Uh, this is reflected in gene expression programs, uh, profiles across the cortical sheet. And you can see here, this is a cross-section of primary visual cortex in three species. Uh, two primates and mouse, and for this gene COX2, there's sort of a, a similar profile. But, you know, there are other genes where we see differences, where, where rodents really are different than primates. Uh, NR4A2 sort of shows this uh, rodent-specific superficial layer expression, whereas it's only, is restricted to deep layers in both primates. And in this nice study from a few years ago, uh, a more comprehensive survey of, of a thousand or so genes found that about a quarter of them uh, show differences between rodent and human. There are also differences in development um, between the primate and mouse. And it goes through many of the same stages, but it's a greatly protracted process in monkey and in human. Um, and there's a large expansion of certain areas of cortex. The, the subplates and the uh, subventricular zone has this outer subventricular zone, which gives rise to neurons in the superficial layers. And so, you know, it's really important to study not only mouse, but uh, a, a primate model organism where we can, we can really look at development within the primate. So this was really the moving into this project that was the, the motivation was to profile all of the layers that were identified based on cytoarchitecture across uh, six prenatal time points and four postnatal. And these prenatal ages were selected to correspond to these uh, different ages of peak neurogenesis for generating different layers of cortex. And uh, these postnatal ages include both infancy through um, pre-puberty and young adult um, non-human primate monkeys. And you can see there's this massive expansion of brain. Well, here you can't see the size difference, but there's a gyrification of the brain. And what this allows us to do is once we have these hundreds and hundreds of samples from different layers, we can, just as a very first uh, sanity check, look in, at the expression of markers of known cell populations in cortex. And you can see that in this heat map representation of the figure I just showed, uh, you have sort of proliferative layers represented in the lower part of the heat map and post-mitotic neuronal layers um, in the upper part. And so this cortical neural progenitor marker, PAC6, is, is expressed, as you'd expect, in these proliferative layers, whereas these post-mitotic neuronal markers are uh, expressed both early and then later postnatally, such as SIT1. So that's looking at genes individually. We can then look at genes globally and look for patterns um, across both age and layer. And what we found is that um, if you represent, take all of the genes and represent, each circle represents a sample from this data set, a cortical sample. Um, and you find that really the largest difference between these samples is, is age. So there's a dramatic shift over age. But there's also some structure between layers, such that adjacent uh, layers are most similar to one another 
as, as you might expect. So layer five looks most like layer six, as opposed to layer two. And uh, one other thing to note is that really most of this, these differences are driven by uh, differences in the proliferative layers, but if we, and many of the post-metonic neuronal layers seem to lay on top of each other as if they're quite similar. But if we select out just these post-mitotic neurons, we find that there's indeed similar structure across those samples as well. So even at a very young age, um, you, there's a, a clear transcriptional difference between superficial layer neurons and, and deep neurons. So this identity is really present from uh, even in newborn neurons. So this, uh, this paper actually looking at human development uh, had uh, not laminar dissected samples, but bulk cortical samples, and showed that there was really a dramatic shift in expression before birth, and that this, these rates of expression change dramatically fall off after birth, postnatally. So this, there's 10 to 100 fold greater, more rapid changes in expression. But really it wasn't known, uh, was this driven just by the fact that all of your proliferative layers have now decreased, you've generated all your neurons, and so perhaps just the proliferation of, of cells was generating this, this high rate of change. And so what we had the opportunity to do is ask, um, you know, how much change is there in the post-mitotic neurons themselves? How rapidly is their identity shifting throughout uh, prenatal development? And that's what's represented on the right here. So each, uh, each column is a different age, and this is comparing how rapidly expression is changing. And the thing really to note, and each row is a different layer through the cortex. So here I'm showing the proliferative layers, and here layer six through layer one. And really the thing to note is that the, the shape of these curves is very similar across all the layers. So there, there really is this dramatic change in in identity of the neurons over time. So we can look more specifically at, you know, what are the genes marking each of these layers relative to the others at different stages. And so, for example, here again I'm showing a simplified version of the heat map I showed a couple of slides ago, um, showing that certain genes mark layer six at different stages of development. So here, this, this gene SLC26A7, um, is highly enriched in layer six early on, but then the expression really just turns off. Whereas some of these markers turn on quite late, and there are very few that have this very persistent uh, marking of those, that neuronal population. And we can look at this, uh, this is just showing four genes, but if we look at this for all genes that mark these different layers at different stages of development, you can see there's this sort of stair-step effect. So. For, for each layer, again, here's layer six, there are a set of genes that mark that, that layer early and a set that mark it late and a, and a relatively small number that are persistent markers. And so this is important to keep in mind if you're in a, a transgenic study, a viral targeting study, you have to really pay attention to obviously what stage of development you're looking at um, because these markers will shift. It's also, uh, I think, would be useful to look at a list of genes such as this to perhaps uh, determine perhaps transcription factors that are important for driving um, maturation of these different types in a dish. So this is, a, a, I think, a resource that can be mined further. So now I'd like to change gears um, and tell you about this, uh, briefly about this uh, study that came out of Sponte Pablo's group. So uh, our, our closest relative, the Neanderthals, uh, cohabited co uh, with humans, Homo sapiens, in Europe for a whole 25,000 years and has made it to the popular press uh, to a large degree is the fact that, in, in fact, there was interbreeding between this species and, you know, we have one to four percent of, uh, and perhaps even more in some people, of Neanderthal DNA. Um, despite this, there are some DNA, um, DNA variants that are human specific. So in all of the human genomes that have been sequenced, this is a fixed mutation in all of those in all of those humans, and is not present in Neanderthal, Denisovan, or in any bird apes. And so there are about thirty thousand out of three billion bases uh, that are that are <coughs> between uh, in humans. And out of those thirty thousand, um, only eighty-seven uh, result in protein coding amino acid changes. 
uh, whereas 108 of them uh, hit a coding region but resulted in the same amino acid. And so this forms a really nice uh, internal control because we can look at um, you know, what, might be the, what might have been the consequence of these protein coding changes in comparison to these silent mutations where we'd expect no effect. So other work, um, so it's been known for a long time that uh, the, uh, the adult Neanderthal brain, on average, is larger than the, than the human brain. Um, leads you to think bigger is maybe not always better. We, we out-competed them. Um, but, and some really nice work has found skulls from neonate Neanderthals. And this has allowed the reconstruction of endocasts to measure uh, brain volumes of different age Neanderthals, and of course humans, it's much easier, and then to compare those uh, against each other and also against CHIMP. And what these studies found is that there's really this accelerated brain growth early in development uh, between the ages of zero and four years old that it maybe accounts for this larger adult brain volume in Neanderthals. And so one might expect these changes were probably uh, occurring even earlier during prenatal development. Um, and so we have this nice atlas. So we have a uh, laser microdissected um, different layers as in the rhesus monkey, but now in, in human cortex. And here we only have two time points that are fairly closely spaced in, during midfetal mid development. But still we can ask, um, you know, are these genes enriched and, and do they show the same expression pattern to some degree in the developing human brain? And in fact, that's, that's what we found. So uh, if you look at those uh, 80 or 90 genes that show protein coding changes, they show significant enrichment in the proliferative layers, in the ventricular zone and subventricular zone. But if you look at the, the 100 genes with the silent mutations, um, there's, there's no concerted pattern in their expression. And so this, this was very interesting. In particular, three of these genes uh, are associated with mitotic spindle, so Cas5, KIF18A, and SPAG5. And several of these have been um, loss of function mutations result in primary microcephaly in humans. And they're really positioned to influence numbers of, of neurons across the cortical sheet and perhaps identity. And so, and, are, and they tend to be expressed early. So, so I think um, his group and others are probably now looking into you know, what is, are, are these actually, uh, these protein coding changes affecting the, the expression or, or um, function of these genes? So, uh, as Jane said, I already thanked everyone, but I'll thank again uh, our founders, uh, Paul and Jody Allen, and the whole team of people it took to put together these atlases, which is an enormous effort. Um, and uh, this is just, I think, the tip of the iceberg for things everyone out here can, can mine. So, thanks.